Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our fifth annual Storytelling SDG series as part of the University of Calgary's International Development Week. My name is Eden. And my name is Sunny. We're going to be your MCs for today and we are streaming in from Calgary, Alberta. Um, and so with that, we would like to first begin by acknowledging the land we are on. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land. As we gather here today in the spirit of respect, reconciliation and reciprocity, we honor and acknowledge the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 people of Southern Alberta. In particular, the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising of the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Stony Nakoda Nations, Sutina First Nation, and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connections and contributions in shaping and strengthening this community in particular and in this province and country as a whole. As settlers, this recognition of the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must be clearly connected to our commitment to make the promise and challenge of truth and reconciliation real within our communities. Now, I encourage all of you to note the Indigenous territory you are on, and if you don't know, for now to make a note to find out. The land we are all on is land on which Indigenous peoples have convened and learned together and continue to do so just as we are today. And if you are not an Indigenous person, then I invite you to acknowledge that you are a settler in a country that has stolen land. Now, some context in what has brought us here today. International Development Week is an annual Canadian tradition since 1991 that aims to recognize, amplify, and celebrate the contributions that Canadians are making through partnerships around the world. Today's event is hosted by the Sustainable Development Goals Alliance, a student-led and community-centered organization leading a platform and network for our campus and community to further mobilize the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. In the spirit of exploring international development, this year's program focuses on the ways Canada and Canadians influence global change through navigating adversity and resiliency, especially in the wake of the pandemic. With that, we present stories on resilience and sustainable development in the pandemic. All right, thank you, Eden. So we're now very excited in to introduce our first three guest speakers who will be presenting individually, followed by a Q&A period and an intermission schedule just before 6 p.m. If you do have a question, you can submit it using a Q&A function, um, which is asked that you reserve it for after all the speakers are done presenting. And if you have the direct, um, and if you have a questions that is directed to a specific speaker, please include a reference for them when you submit your questions. Um, on the screen, you are seeing the housekeeping and we're now that to indicate that this is a safe space for everyone. We accept all opinions um, and you can feel safe asking your questions and um, expressing your concerns. Now, um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker of the night, Joseph. Joseph Lam is a fourth year bioinformatics undergraduate at the University of Calgary. He was the previous vice president of events for the campus creative writing circle club. Having brought other writers and students to create and collaborate, Joseph has also been featured as the third place winner in the 2018 Celebrating Words competition, as well as in the recent May 2021 volume seven issued by the Pipen magazine. Spoken word poetry has given Joseph the avenue to talk about mental health, LGBTQ issues, amongst other topics he wishes to bring attention to. So I'll now pass it on to Joseph to share his work with us. Um, Joseph, take it away. Um, hi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, this is just a really short poem uh, that I wrote back in the last spring. Um, so yeah, it's called, it's called Riot Blood. Um, I, I guess I'll just um, read it. Um, okay. Um, so, um, on, on the streets of Portland, a body lies in the forgetful turbidity of a street light pulsing like the gash of an open wound. His fingers twitch to the thrum of 10,000 feet marching at the husk of dawn, breathing their urgency into his veins. I'm 100,000 miles away from this man, but I still feel the pull of his legs. His arms branch thick around the root of my pumping heart. 
I imagine how a bone learns to bend around a hand, how it curls into the flesh's hair, hangs onto the collarbone like a ladder rung to heaven. Heaven makes me think about the prayers in your toes, the beads you use to walk when your hands are scraped raw from the violence, when news that another name is lost to the mad indifference of the world hits, I make like a ship and let the bows fall. I anchor my body closer to his, warm my spine in the hands of his faith. I lay awake to the bed frame, making drums of my ankles, sleepwalking the city lanes until I'm with him. There are still sharks swimming in his eyes, diving into the blood-soaked bandanas and tear gas canisters hammering in his chest, fighting for the right to exist. When we are home, I lay his head into my lap and wonder if this isn't love, if this isn't the holiest thing I've ever done. Oh, okay, so, so that's it. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, Joseph, for um, sharing your poem, your poetry with us. Um, it's really amazing to listen to your like sharings and your thoughts. And I know that it took a lot of time for you to reflect and write the words. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Edin to introduce the second guest speakers. Thank you, Fanny, and thank you, Joseph, for sharing your poem with us. That was very powerful. Thank you. And now introducing Shivi. Shivi Saigal is a recent University of Calgary graduate with a bachelor's degree in education who is passionate about bringing diversity and inclusion to the forefront through education. Having graduated in 2021 in the middle of the pandemic, Shivi faced the rise of local budget cuts and job insecurity in her field. This challenged her to take a chance on going abroad to teach the Canadian curriculum at an international school in Bahrain. And as an educator, she works to instill passion within her students by helping them embrace their differences and interests within their learning environment. With that, I pass the stage on to Shivi. Feel free to share your screen and your audio. Um, hello, everyone. Just a heads up, I'm a little so, um, sleep deprived because it's 3 a.m. in Bahrain, but <laughs> I'll try my best to get through this. And I am... I'm really excited and really happy to be chosen to speak on this event. Um, so my name is Shivi. I am a recent graduate from the University of Calgary, and I wanted to share with you my story of traveling and teaching amidst the pandemic. I studied a Bachelor of Arts in Global Development Studies with a minor in Anthropology, um, as, as well as a Bachelor of Education specialization, specializing in English as an additional language. Also a little more background about me. I immigrated to Canada with my family when I was nine years old. And when we moved to Calgary, we stayed on the Northwestern part of the city. Um, so that little, that little element to that story is really, really important because while growing up, the Northwest part of Calgary is very white dominated. And so I really felt like I was a minority. Um, so when I did enter University of Calgary, I felt that there was I was a little bit, in a, I, was, I, was, <laughs> I was in shock because I saw a lot of people of color. Studying anthropology allowed me to understand the cultural relevance of sharing, of shaping people. And through that, I was able to develop a passion of inclusion and diversity and understanding the importance of embracing your differences. Um, so as soon as I kind of saw that, I, I this, passion instilled in me and I really, really wanted to share that with the world. So throughout my undergrad, I also found out about an organization. It was an after school program um, where I worked with immigrant and refugee youth. And as a, as a facilitator, I mentored them to embrace their differences as well as integrate into Canadian culture without losing what they have. So through this exposure, I decided to, again, make, a, make it a mission to incorporate diversity and inclusion within my teaching practice. As an eager, passionate graduate, I wanted that, I was really excited to create a welcoming and inclusive environment for my students. However, amidst graduating amidst a pandemic made um, budgeting cuts common and put a lot more pressure on getting a job than normal. To add to that, teaching became significantly harder because um, not only did we have to think about teaching them the content, but also doing it within a pandemic and considering safety and single use items, 
and all of that fun stuff. So at this point, I felt like I related really closely to a poem by Robert Frost, a very popular, a really popular poem called The Road Not Taken. And I decided to choose the one less traveled by. Moving, um, uh, moving amidst a pandemic to a foreign country all the way across the world to begin a career is a feeling that is indescribable. I felt every single emotion leading up to this. However, it did not sink into me until I began teaching in September of last year. I felt like I was on vacation up until it was time to teach and the imposter syndrome really started to sink in. I was very eager to begin my journey, however, and to educate these young minds about opening their hearts to diversity and inclusion. It has not been an easy trail at, at all, which I felt it would be um, because I was teaching at a Canadian curriculum school in Bahrain. Um, for those of you who don't know where Bahrain is, it's connected, it's pretty much connected to Saudi Arabia. It is the tiniest country I have ever <laughs> been to. It has not, again, it has not been easy. And there's been times where I felt really, really frustrated due to some of the parents and some of the students being close-minded to the idea of learning about new cultures and different people. I began to realize that I took for granted how speaking about certain topics in Canada seemed a lot easier than it did moving abroad. And I also felt that I felt a little bit of a shock considering most of the population of Bahrain is expats and there was a lot of diversity. So I felt that having seen this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it to be so different. However, with little steps, I have been able to overcome some of these obstacles and I continually remind myself that though culti multiculturalism is a huge part of Canadian culture, I must be respectful of the country I'm now in and their values and their beliefs. I do feel that I have to step on eggshells sometimes and there's a lot of little fights that I have to get into con continually. However, I'm still continuing to educate these students in, on a smaller scale to help them understand that a peaceful future starts with them understanding one another. And that is all for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Savish, for sharing with us. We appreciate your stories. And um, I love how you mentioned like, diversity means a lot to you and you kind of want to spread it out to other people and teach children how to like welcome their heart to diversity too. I have a lot of questions to ask. I'm going to save it for the Q&A. Um, so for now, I'm going to um, pass it on to Timid. And before passing it on to him, I'm going to give a little bit of and introductions. So Hafiz, um, Tamid Al Hafiz is a third year undergraduate student pursuing a bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering. Born and raised in Bangladesh, he completed his senior secondary certificate SSC from Chittagong Collegiate School and higher secondary certificate HSC from Dhaka, Dhaka College before joining the University of Alberta. Hafiz is also currently serving as the board of directors chair at the Engineering Student Society at the University of Alberta, an elected representative on his university's highest academic governing body, the General Faculties Council, as well as the appointed senator to the University of Alberta Senate. In 2021, he founded Pluvial, an all natural sustainable dishwashing soap that is distributed in a unique biodegradable paper water bottle known as an avid nature lover and a strong advocate for wildlife conservation, his aim to promote widespread implementation of sustainable design and eco-friendly engineering methods on a global scale. So on the screen, you see Hafiz. Um, I'm going to pass it off to you. It seems like you're so ready for this. Well, thank you so much, Sunny. Uh, it was a very heavy bio. I should have made it shorter. So, well, Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in. I am Hafiz. So uh, can I get like a quick audio check, please? Like uh, a thumbs up from one of the hosts, because I have some problems sometimes with my laptop. So am I completely audible? Again, Hafiz. Yeah, thank you so much. So we're good to go. 
So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in this storytelling event hosted by the Sustainable Development Goals Alliance. The title of this talk is Addressing the Wealth Gap in the Asia, Asia Pacific and Striking Inequalities that Come with It. And its primary focus would be SDG 4 and SDG 10. So I'll just quickly start sharing my screen right now so you folks can see uh, my slides. Hmm. Here we go. I hope you can all see it. Yeah, looks all perfect to me. So yes, uh, just like I mentioned, so the title of this talk is Addressing the Wealth Gap in the Asia Pacific and the Striking Inequalities that Come with It. And the primary focus of this talk would be SDG 4, which is quality education, and SDG 10, that is reduced inequalities. So uh, time for an introduction. So uh, Sunny pretty much covered all my professional uh, credentials and everything. So I'll just shortly dive into like my personal life a little bit. Who am I, where I come from? So um, my full name is Tahmid Al Hafiz and I use he, him pronouns. Although I go by, by, by my last name, Hafiz. That's pretty much uh, how everyone in my family goes by. So I'm currently in my third year of civil and engineering at the University of Alberta, and I'm currently joining you from Edmonton, which we proudly acknowledge as Treaty 6 territory. So I was born and raised in Bangladesh, which is a very small country in South Asia, but it has a bustling population for its size. So aside from that, uh, I'm a huge soccer fanatic, and I support London-based football club Arsenal FC. People do know me as an avid nature lover and a strong advocate for wildlife conservation. Practically, you know, I'm a wildlife and nature photographer. So the chances are that you'll find me more in the jungle than in my apartment. So, I mean, whenever the weather is nice, I just take my camera and I just go out to take pictures. It's always exciting and it's always such a rewarding experience for me. And here you can see a few of my photos that I had taken. And if you're interested in seeing more, then please feel free to check out my Instagram, which is like mentioned here. And I'll just wrap it up by saying one of my, you know, favorite quotes, uh, being a very lazy person myself, you know, I personally like this quote a lot and I don't know where I got it from. It is like the best thing to do first thing in the morning is to go right back to sleep. And I totally resonate with it. Okay, so now moving on to the main segment of my talk. Education, why is it so important? You know, through your frustrating school years, you may have thought that it was just a waste of time or just something that you needed to do in order to get a job. But, you know, truth be told, education goes so much beyond just getting a job and making your parents happy. In fact, it's one of the most powerful tools out there. Education means studying in order to obtain a deeper knowledge and understanding how it could be applied to daily life. Education is never limited to just knowledge from the books, but can also be obtained from practical experiences outside of the classroom. Equity in education is just as important as education itself. In fact, equitable education opportunities are a fundamental human right. Article 28 of the Convention on the Human Rights of the Child, AKA CRC, and the Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights all each enshrine this right of promoting education for all. Oops. Yeah. Okay, let's just dive a little deeper into it. Is this really the case? Despite global efforts to expand educational opportunities for women, gender inequalities persist in many, many developing countries. Uh, to address the root causes of gender inequalities in secondary education, we ask whether such disparities persist because of low state capacity or low willingness. This very well explained chart shows us some alarming statistics regarding gender inequality in education. Approximately one out of five adolescent girls are out of school. And globally, that number stands at a whopping 65 million. However, as a positive matter of fact, educated mothers are more than twice as likely to send their daughters to school 
and a girl with an extra year of education can earn 20% more than what she do without it. So it is pretty evident how education plays a pivotal role in addressing gender equality. Now, let's investigate which nations are lagging behind the most in terms of equity in education. As I mentioned before, I was born and raised in Bangladesh, which is a small country in South Asia, but it has a bustling population for its size. Before moving to Canada to pursue my higher education, I had spent 20 years of my life growing up in seven different cities there. The entirety of my education came from studying in government schools under the country's public education system. So uh, the institutions that Sunny mentioned, Chittagong College School and Taka College, they are both government institutions. And for a clarification, in Bangladesh, the term college is referred to as grade 11 and 12, just like, you know, uh, in the British system, because, you know, colonial, uh, colonialization, uh, because Bangladesh was under British rule for approximately 200 years, and that's when most of the schools and colleges were found. So we call grade 1 to 10 as school and grade 11 and 12 as college. So getting back to the main point, uh, private schools, which Bangladesh does not have too many, are something not everyone can afford. In rural areas of Bangladesh, where poverty still dominates, it is not uncommon for families to never send their girls to school. Well, I've seen families, like they've had four or five girls there and none of them ever went to school, even though like school was pretty much free, these public schools were pretty much free around them. Like Bangladesh, some of its South Asian neighbors also share a similar situation in the space. According to data from UNESCO, about 27 million children aged 5 to 13 are out of school in these four countries, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. So it is clear that education gap still continues to exist in our society to this day as income inequality and economic segregation continues to rise. Educational inequality starts early, before even a child starts school, and it does not stop there. It continues and widens throughout school and has an impact throughout a child's life. Studying in the country's public education system all my life, I was able to witness up close all these major problems that exist within. It was more shocking to me when I came to Canada and clearly experienced the stark difference in the quality of education and infrastructure between the two countries. Now, Coming to the boring part, which is also crucial, and that is statistics. I promise I'll skim through this quickly and not get too technical here. And just to mention, all these data were obtained from an independent research conducted by SCAP. So in terms of attaining students aged 20 to 35 years in secondary education, Kazakhstan, Armenia, and Kyrgyzstan do the best job in doing so by keeping their average attainment rate well about well above 80% in Asia. Starting from the Philippines and Mongolia, this is where things start to get a little bit shaky. Their average attainment rates stand at about 70%, but with massive outliers suggesting that some of their population groups are more deprived than the others. Three Southeast Asian giants, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam show a similar trend of data. It's not that great, not too bad either, but it is when you get to South Asian countries like India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Maldives, the data gets very alarming as the average attainment rate drops to only around 20%. Now, let's check out how wealth affects the education gap in Asia. In all of these cases, it is evident that wealth, or the lack of it actually, plays a significant role in allowing people to achieve education. Interestingly, for countries like Laos, Cambodia, India, alongside others, residence is actually the dominant factor in the decomposition of the index and not wealth. Gender is a major barrier as girls have very little access to education in Afghanistan and Kazakhstan, followed by India. Cambodia and Bhutan also suffer from similar problems, but to a lesser extent.
let's also have a quick overview of how other key factors play a role in the gap of education. It can be seen that people of certain ethnicity or religion will lag well behind education than others. Especially in Laos, it seems like a very major issue. While Vietnam and Afghanistan also displayed their fair share of problem in this D index. Now, let's understand the UN Sustainable Development Goals a little better. The UN SDG number four, which is quality education and one of the most important goals in my opinion. It seeks to ensure access to equitable and quality education through all stages of life for everyone on the planet. It also aims to increase the number of young people and adults who have relevant skills for employment, decent jobs and entrepreneurship. The goal also investigates the elimination of gender and income disparities in access to education. On the other hand, on the other hand, SDG 10, which is reduce inequalities, addresses inequalities within and amongst different countries. It calls for nations to reduce inequalities in income, as well as those based on sex, age, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion, or economic, or basically any other status within a country. This goal also addresses inequalities amongst countries, including those related to representation, and calls for the facilitation of orderly and safe migration and mobility of people. It is now time to address exactly how we can do better. First and foremost, we need to identify the root cause of problems in every society and population group and create a proper strategic plan to resolve them. Exploring all the three key factors of social, economic, and cultural reasons to investigate localized disparity is also very important. We also need to push the governments to increase incentives for low-income families to keep their children in school. Aside from that, Reducing the overall cost of education and offering more public education opportunities from every government side is also very, very necessary. We need to make sure that every child is receiving high quality education from an early age and that they manage to build up a strong foundation for the future for a smooth transition to higher education. As we spoke about gender gap before, Supporting every female student in various means throughout their education life is absolutely essential, at least until they integrate into a workspace. And last but not the least, we should prioritize supporting low-income families so that they actually send their children to school voluntarily rather than being forced to do it. This can be done through various social protection programs and public infrastructure investment schemes. So thank you everyone. Thank you for your patience and uh, taking your time to hear this talk. I really hope you managed to learn something new from it. And uh, I am open to taking any questions in the question and answer period. Um, thank you, Hafiz, for sharing your beliefs on education and equality in education. Um, we'll now pass it off to the Q&A sections. Um, I'm going to share my screen if you don't mind. Thank you, Hafiz. Okay, so as mentioned before, please feel free to use the Q&A chat box to post your questions. And if you have questions for Zavi and Hafiz, please indicate that in your message to help us facilitate the sections. Um, that being said, I'm going to read off the questions for um, the guest speakers. So the first question is actually for Hafiz. Um, I think you answered this in your presentation, but I um, would address it in a way that's more you know, appropriate uh, especially in the sphere of the pandemic, what is it about equality in education and addressing educational inequalities that you believe that you can enact the most change, especially during the pandemic? Well, that is a really good question. So I am in constant touch with my friends back in Bangladesh who are currently in like third or fourth year of universities right now, along with me. So, I mean, they technically should have been in their third or fourth year, but you know, due to this pandemic, most universities in Bangladesh decided to like shut down almost 
permanently rather than continuing their education online. The biggest reason due to that is wealth gap and it's like lack of infrastructure. Bangladesh is a pretty spread out country and the majority of the population is rural where the internet connection is not the best we can get. So, you know, running schools, colleges and universities online would mean that it would increase that uh, gap in education furthermore between people living in rural areas and also in cities. So the government and the Ministry of Education practically had no choice but to keep you know, education and universities halted for an indefinite amount of time. So in between, most universities have lost somewhere between 16 to 18 months of education. And my friends who should have been in the fourth year of education right now are still in their like second year or just finishing their first year, which is quite alarming. And it totally tells you the huge difference between the infrastructure between two countries, let's say Canada and Bangladesh, we both started, I mean, we all started in the same time, my friends and I at university, but I'm currently in my third year, just finishing my third year, but many of my friends are still stuck in like the second year to starting it actually. Well, wow, thank you for sharing. Being an international student and spending 12 years of my life studying in Vietnam and now studying in Canada, I totally understand what you're talking about. And I really appreciate the efforts of you and the people who are like you to like stand up and kind of like make changes, um, take advantage of the privilege and the opportunities that we have here. Um, I would forward that question to Savir too. Like what is the change that you witness in terms of diversity in education and especially in the context of the pandemic? And what do you think could be a potential solution? Can you please repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so during the pandemic, what is the change in diversity in education that you see? And what do you think could be a potential solution? A change in diversity and inclusion in education? Yeah. What do you mean by the change? Um, so like with the pandemic makes it more difficult for like people to make um, education accessible for, you know, all genders, like people from all backgrounds, or is it like, what is the, like, is it harder for you to do that? Um, I think for me, the most difficult part with diversity and inclusion in my teaching currently right now is honestly fitting within the cultural norms of a different country. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the hardest part because you have to be respectful of their culture and their beliefs. Um, and I think being in a new country, you kind of have to value that. I know that I'm coming from a different country and I know that multiculturalism is, is a huge topic that we talk about in Canada. Um, so that does make it difficult. And you obviously, the first thing that they tell you in education is um, as an educator, you should never embark, you should never tell your students your opinions and you should never instill in them your beliefs and your biases. And you have to kind of push them aside and understand from their perspective. And even if they are contradicting yours, you are not supposed to tell them, oh, like your opinion is wrong and move from there. So that's, that's always a touchy topic and that's always difficult to include. Um, within a pandemic, you know, there's certain things that you have to consider, obviously, but I think it's, it's mostly the, the access does deplete when when um, you are in a pandemic, especially especially when you're moving back from in-person and online and in-person and online. Thank you very I much. For I answered that, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Uh, the answer like totally answers my questions. Um, so this is for all of the guests, um, like specifically for Hafiz and Suvi, what according to your opinions, opportunities in creating, COVID-19 pandemic for increasing and improving social resilience among the poor and low social economic status of population in Canada and in other countries around the world? Well, I guess I'll go for that first. So COVID-19 has been running way longer than we actually expected. Some countries have done better than the others, especially the ones with strong economic foundation. It really had shaken the pillars of the governments and the economic 
structure of most countries around the globe. I mean, no one can actually deny that. In terms of education, let's say countries with already good existing infrastructure fared better than much many developing countries, especially in Africa and in Asia. So COVID-19 was definitely a hit that we were not looking forward to. And it, 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 I personally feel that it played a crucial role in already just you know, extending that gap, making it much bigger, which already existed in education between developed countries and developing countries. Thank you, Hafiz. Um, Sabit, do you have like any thoughts on it that you want to share? Um, sorry, I'm gonna read the question again, just to absorb what it's asking. <laughs> just give me one second. Um, I think Hafiz pretty much covered what I would say. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. And um, the question is, what would you say should be our top priorities for women who are struggling to transition in post-secondary education? So. For women specifically? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say, that definitely if you are able to partner up with someone who's in university um, already, or if, if they do know someone, I know that there is a wonderful program that they can sign up for if they're in, if they are in um, high school right now, it's called TIPS. It's called Transitioning into Post-Secondary. It's by the same organization that I worked for. And they pretty much mentor you with a person who works at the, who goes to the university, any university, it doesn't have to be University of Calgary. And um, they kind of lead you through that program specifically and tell you about the different options and how to smoothly integrate into your university career. So they can do that. They can partner up with someone who's already in university and they can also talk, speak to me if they want. I love speaking to students who are going to university and helping them through that process. There's also a million clubs at the University of Calgary that they can also sign up for to help their process. I'm not sure, um, can the person who asked that question elaborate what you mean by a female specifically? Um, I think it would have to take some time for them to like type in what they like what they mean by that. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, Hafiz, do you have any insight that you want to share? Well, on this issue, I personally feel that for every female student out there, if you're transitioning into post-secondary education, just always feel confident. So you're here, you're going into post-secondary education because you earned it. You're no less than your male counterpart counterpart out there. At this moment, I see that, uh, I personally see, I mean, lesser representation for female students in especially STEM courses in engineering. Uh, it's majority of, uh, it's majorly dominated by male students, kind of like a seven to three ratio, but it doesn't have to stay that way. I mean, our female students, they need to believe that they can be equally good or even better than us in different STEM related fields. So getting that confidence in your heart should be like the first priority if you're transitioning into post-secondary education. Thank you for sharing. And um, Suvi, um, the person asking that question said that um, all students and the woman part was specific to a point made in um, Hafiz's presentations where he talks about like, like the inequality and inaccessibility between like women and like um, men uh, in assessing the educations. Um, okay, so moving on to the next question. This is directed to Hafiz. Um, they say that they see that you're very passionate about this topic. Um, you mentioned Afghan Afghanistan and they see your solutions. They are very great solutions for a normal country with a proper government. How do you think your solutions would be received in a country that is ruled by insurgents, um, i.e. the Taliban? 
Okay, okay, okay. So this is a very interesting question and I actually read it like a couple minutes ago. So if I wanted to discuss about it, I could possibly go all day, but I'll keep it brief. So the thing with countries like Afghanistan and Syria and possibly uh, like a few other countries in Africa, let's say Sudan, the problem with them is that they do not have a sustainable government. I mean, they're ruled by, you know, forcefully ruled by such organizations, which we indefinitely know will collapse sometime soon. And we need to look back, let's say a couple of decades back as to where these people come from. These people were born in a war-torn country. So even these people, like the Taliban people, they did not have any access to education. Let's say a Taliban soldier who is probably like 25 years old, that person was born in the midst of a total disaster. So education opens doors to higher education. So at this moment, what the developed co uh, countries can do or take a step is that they can uh, you know, strike a deal with them or negotiate that instead of bombing you with our fifth generation advanced fighter jets, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna rebuild your country. We're gonna build roads. We're gonna build hospitals and schools on one condition that you allow accessible education to every single population in your country. And given that they do not have any foreign diplomatic ties and they do not have any foreign revenue, I do not see any reason that they would not agree to that if they're approached in a friendly manner. Um, I think the follow-up question to that is, how has education technology impacted students learning in some rural area in India where internet is intermittent and what is the perception and reference for online education in India during COVID? Well, it's pretty much the same in uh, rural parts of India and Bangladesh. They're very, very similar countries. And I myself have like roots in India to my mother's side, they're Indian. So it's very, sim it's very similar. I've been to India so many times and it's nothing different from India and Bangladesh. So the thing with that, it's such a massive and spread out country. Building infrastructure there is very hard, especially on a strict e economical budget like what India and Bangladesh run said, it is quite impossible to get internet there in every corner of every single villages unless you start printing money by magic. So it has definitely affected students because a lot of students from rural areas in India or Bangladesh, they move to bigger cities or their nearest bigger city for education. And due to COVID-19, all the universities closed down. And, you know, living in a bigger city is much more expensive than living in villages. So what the students ultimately had to do is move back to their villages for an indefinite amount of time, because they couldn't just bear the cost of living in cities without the jobs and everything. So, you know, what happened next? It's like lack of internet and everything. Their education was halted for an indefinite amount of time. And I I still know friends from India and Bangladesh who are like really struggling to even like remember stuff that they read in their first year of university because they just don't have uh, access to proper internet and other stuff. Thank you, Hafiz. And this question is for Subi. Um, so the person said that they find very inspired by your stories and they are wondering what the students' demographics are like age usually because it's easier to instill values and beliefs in kids and how acceptive are your student of the idea of diversity and inclusion um so i teach grade two so the kids are about seven to eight years old and usually international schools tend to be more um, of the local students and then there's a few international um, I was lucky enough to get a class that was about 90% local students and then about 10% of my students were international students. So the backlash was a little bit more excessive than I would have ever imagined. But honestly, it's um, the beautiful thing is that making those small um, little, I don't wanna say like putting little seeds of doubt or little dropping little hints, but I've kind of been doing that and they've opened up significantly since the beginning. I've already seen growth in my students. It's just on a smaller scale, instead of um, teaching them, oh, you know, people look different and over here, 
these people practice this religion, I more likely do it in as a way of look around the classroom. Do we all celebrate the same holidays? Do we all celebrate? Do we all look the same? Do we all come from the same families? What makes us different? And really doing the inquiry part of um, engaging them in that sense. And to be very honest, kids are so eager and so excited to learn about different people. It's more the older generation sometimes that kind of impede them from getting that understanding and getting that learning. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, questions, this question is directed to both because I think that you guys are like basically impacting and trying to create sustainable uh, changes using education. What do you think is the intersectionality between like education and other SDG goals? Uh, should we do you want to go first? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll just drop in real quick. So personally, I do see that question that what other goals UN SDGs that uh, resonate well with the thing that we're trying to promote. So I personally feel that SDG goal number one, which is no poverty, and SDG goal number five, which is gender equality, also resonate very well with the matter that we are trying to promote. Because number one, no poverty, like poverty is one of the biggest roots of all the problems out there, like inequality. Like if, if someone has the money, I do not see the reason why that person wouldn't be sending their children to the best schools. That person is being forced to not send their children to school and maybe like send them to child labor. That's because that person is living below the poverty line and getting food on the table is more important than learning calculus in school. So the other thing would be gender equality and uh, gender equality is not just an issue in education. It's pretty much an issue in everywhere on the job sector, as well as in leadership. Uh, I mean, I still see that most leaders in Asia are male leaders, although we have an exception in Bangladesh. We have been having female leaders since like the last couple of decades. But yes, it is still a big problem and gender equality needs to be solved in order to be, it's kind of like a domino effect, you know? If you solve gender equality, a lot of other problems automatically get, get solved themselves. Um, so I'm just, I had to pull up the document. Um, and I honestly think that every single goal relates to education because as an educator, you talk about every single one of these topics. You talk about hunger, you talk about good well-being, you, talk, you speak about how can we create an economy where there is an equal gender gap. Um, again, the content starts with the age group of the students. I can't exactly talk to grade two students about, you know, there's a gender gap between equal pay, but we speak about every single topic, about how to be a responsible citizen, about how to take action on creating a healthy and safe environment. So every single sustainable development goal completely intersects with education. And um, through these goals, again, we're able to build a better future because students are informed. All right. Thank you, guest speakers, for your time and your like uh, insights given on these questions. Um, I can see a lot of other questions in the Q&A. However, with the time constraints, um, we will have to move on with a break and we're happy to address any of your concerns or questions over email and we will share the email contacts app, like at the end of this event. Um, so for now, we're going to, um, I'm going to pass it back to Eden. Um, yeah, so Eden. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shivi and Hafiz, for all those amazing answers to all to a lot of complicated questions, <laughs> a lot of heavy questions. But again, thank you and thank you to everyone for your questions and participation. Uh, we'll now go for a break. Feel free to take a five minute break and join us again at 6 p.m. MST.
All right, five minutes is up, everyone. Uh, welcome back. We will now be continuing with the event with our next speaker, Chris. Thank you, Sunny. <laughs> so Christopher Joseph is close to home for many of us as a born and raised Calgarian, having graduated as an engineer from the University of Calgary and a driven entrepreneur owning two entertainment-based companies, Big Fun Canada and Big Box Tunes, Chris's mission is to normalize kindness and authenticity in the story of success in life. Um, so now I leave the floor up to you in the challenges you face within the pandemic, Chris. Um, yeah, looking forward to hear from you. Sure. Well, it looks like I have like a double chin. Well, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Christopher Joseph, born and raised Calgarian. Graduated from the University of Calgary as a degree in mechanical engineering. I am now a managing engineer at an engineering firm. As mentioned, I also own um, entertainment companies. One is Big Fun Canada, which specializes in music, photo booths, and party games for the Calgary Flames, Roughneck Stampeders. We've done work with MTV, Much Music, The Great Cup, Samsung. We've done weddings, stampede, barbecues, DJs across nightclubs across Canada. So we've done quite a bit. Um, Obviously, that took a huge hit over the, next, the last two years, uh, basically wiping us out. And that's partially why I got asked to speak here today, just talking about the, uh, the challenges I faced over the last couple of years and how I kind of got my mind right, how I created some sustainable development goals for myself and some sustainable development strategies for my personal um, men mental well-being and uh, how that kind of helped me get into fixing my business issues. Um, I'll try to keep it pretty upbeat, um, but over the last two years, I've lost five family members, uh, either due to COVID or due to uh, vaccine complications. Um, I lost a cousin due to suicide, um, so that was pretty tough. And then also, like I said, my business kind of collapsed because no one's going out, <laughs> no one's uh, needing entertainment. And as a pretty social guy, I love entertaining, I love talking to people, I love being with my friends. So when COVID kind of hit, basically everything that I knew, everything that made me me was gone. Um, and that really deteriorated myself. I kind of lost myself. I really had no motivation to do anything. Um, just got me into a pretty bad depressionistic state. Um, I didn't really get any happiness or joy from the things that I used to. Didn't really feel like doing anything um, to the point where I just didn't care about life in general. Um, I guess I, and the point where it got really scary for me was when I thought about, um, like taking my own life and, uh, how I didn't care. So I didn't care about myself. I didn't care about the hole I would leave. I didn't care about hurting my family. I didn't care about hurting my friends. And that's when it really clicked that, Hey, there's something wrong here. I feel very numb to what's going on to uh, myself, to the world, and I th thought things needed to change. So I did. It took some time, but I basically tried to create some strategies for myself to do it on my own, to try and get myself out of this, this hole that I dug for myself and get my mind right. And once you kind of get your mind right, then you can start looking at the problems that you're facing in a more clear sense. So after doing that, we pivoted our business slightly. We have another business called Big Box Tunes, which specializes in radio service. So we build custom radio stations for business um, and retail chains across Canada. And that's kind of where we focus. So now I kind of got my groove back because I could create an atmosphere that people enjoy. I get to engage. I just don't have to be there. So that was like a huge relief on my part because now I'm starting to get my ground. I'm starting to get my life back. So I just want to talk about a little bit about the strategies that I used to kind of create that sustainable well-being and that sustainable I guess, growth from then to now and will serve me well from now till later. So I kind of broke it up into five strategies or five little tips. So the first lesson is how you feel is okay. So you have to acknowledge the fact that how you feel is valid, right? There are seven basic emotions. Five of them are negative. One's surprise. So it can be negative. It could be positive and one's happiness. So you're ready at a deficit. So you're already like trained to feel negative emotions. And if you even think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, well, where's the threat? 
The threat is where you feel anger, where you feel fear, where you feel disgust, where you feel sadness, where you feel contempt, right? So you're already wired to notice the, uh, the negativity um, versus the happiness. And now studies are showing that happiness is actually 30% attributed to genetics. So more or less, the main reasons why you could feel bad is not even your fault. So it's, it's okay to feel the way you feel. Now, the next lesson is you have time. Stop putting so much pressure to heal fit quickly, to heal, to fix problems. I know I was really bad for that. I always get frustrated when I'm not progressing, when I'm not um, trying to get towards my goals. I'm just kind of sitting and stagnant it gives me a lot of anxiety, but it's okay. Like progression is not the bar, just staying still and breathing and you're alive, you're good. That's the bar. If you progress, great. As long as you're not deteriorating, you're also okay, right? Ju Judge Judy said it pretty well. If you don't make it in your 20s, you can make it in your 30s. And if you don't make it in your 30s, you can make it in your 40s. And if you don't make it in your 40s, you can make it in your 50s. So you have time to just stay calm, be still, and listen to yourself. Now, this is a lesson that I learned from one of my mentors. It's you cannot solve problems in the same plane that they were created. So a lot of mental health and mental well-being comes from the mind, obviously, mental health. So if the problems are generating from there, then you have to solve that problem in a different state. So if it's mental, then you probably want to go into physical. So do the things that normally would make you happy, right? You need a routine. So sleep is so huge. So if you disrupt your circadian rhythms, that's the thing that regulates your mood also. So say you have a bad sleep, Say you're not sleeping the times you normally should. If you're not committed to a routine, that's also giving yourself um, a bad start. Uh, feed yourself mind, body, and soul. Food that you eat, the books that you're reading, the content that you're watching. Be very mindful of what you're introducing into your life. And worse comes to worse, if you're feeling a lot of tension, if you're feeling a lot of um, emotions, scream it out. That was the biggest lesson that I learned from one of my mentors, it's just, it's, it's so much tension. It's so much charge in your body. Just let it out, scream it out. You'll feel a lot better. Do that consistently, which is the next lesson is build momentum that actually helps you along the way. In a sense of personal growth, you may think, hey, I'm not where I want to be. And you start to think about how far you have left to go. But if you do step-by-step step, over and over and over again, eventually it starts to click. And it goes from, how far do I have left to how far can I go? How far can I take this? So the way I would explain it is like doing a plank. When you're doing a plank for a minute, that minute is hell. Everyone hates planks, right? But you do a plank for a minute long enough and consistently enough, you start to think, well, how, far, how long can I hold this plank? So same kind of thing here. How far can I go? What happens if I actually make it through? The, the last lesson is celebrate both your wins and losses. I was in a talk with Sarah Blakely. She's one of the America's most prolific businesswomen. She owns 100% of Spanx, which got so, bought out for $1.2 billion. So she's, she did pretty well. And she would tell this story about how when she was a kid, she would be at the dinner table. And before they ate dinner, her father would ask, Sarah, what did you fail at today? And she would tell the story about what she failed at during the day. And she said, and her father would go, oh my God, Sarah, that's great. And then give her a high five. So her definition of failure is very positive. It's about growth. It's about personal development. Whereas at least me growing up, failure was bad, right? Failure was a negative thing. You don't want failure at all, right? So trying to change that narrative and being celebratory of the things that you maybe didn't achieve, but you learned from is just as important as celebrating the wins. So in conclusion, since my time is kind of running out here, uh, these are some things that I did that I can do on my own, right? Some people feel when they're going through mental situations um, that no one really understands them or you don't trust them enough to help you. So this might be a way for you to kind of at least think about some strategies, some little, little tips and tricks that can help you along the way. You know, it's okay to feel the way you feel. That's probably the biggest one. The way you feel, the way you heal, just, just take your time, do your thing. 
it's, it's actually one of the rules that I, I, I wouldn't say coined, but made up for myself. It's the, but that's okay rule. So for example, you know, I'm feeling depressed for no reason at all. And it's really bugging me, but that's okay. Or I'm very anxious to go out today. I really don't feel like it, but that's okay. And that just makes you feel so much more positive about what you're feeling and what you're going through. And I'd like to leave you guys with this quote, which I think exemplifies how I feel about trauma. Uh, and it goes like this. Whether our trauma or life lessons originate from the past or present, it blocks our connection with the self and the love embodied by the divine. I truly believe and have personally experienced that all forms and dimensions of trauma can be healed. And when it happens, we learn something valuable about life. Our soul grows, we gain greater access to the love, light, and creativity that is within us and is all around us. Trauma blocks love, connection, and creativity. And in turn, love has the power to transcend trauma, heal us, and reconnect us to ourselves, our soul, our source, and to each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your story. I think a lot of the things that you spoke on today um, and shared with us is really valuable for a lot of our participants um, and just to people in general. Um, there are a lot of things that people deal with that are hidden, are invisible, that people don't know about, and it comes from a really deep place for you to even be able to admit that and also do the work to address it. So thank you. Um, I'll now be passing it off to Sunny to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Chris. I just want to say, well, I just want to send you my appreciation for your quote about love and trauma. I think like healing is not a linear process, like it's not a linear journey and like starting learning how to love yourself and love your trauma and love your journey is like a good step to start. Um, so I'm now going to introduce another guest speaker, uh, Maide Mosel Vosadeh. Um, she is an Iranian visual artist based in Calgary, Canada, and has recently received her Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Calgary. Yay! Um, Maide creates illustrations and animations to discuss issues surrounding plastic solutions. She explores ways in which art can evoke emotions and bring awareness about environmental issues and problems caused in our troubled age. In pursuing her endeavor for increasing general awareness about plastic so pollution and reaching out to more people, she has has created a social media platform called A Yellow Land. And then this platform, she shares her artistic practice and idea. So now I'm going to pass the mic and screen to her um, so she could share with you her stories and arts. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. I'm just gonna... Please let me know if you're seeing it okay. Okay. Yes, we're seeing it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I am Adamo Sarazadeh and um, I... I'm from Tehran, Iran. I got my bachelor's at Art University of Tehran, and uh, I recently received my Master of Fine Arts at the Univers University of Calgary. Um, my research focuses on how art can help to bring heightened awareness about plastic pollution. Uh, I create drawings uh, that processes this topic uh, and tells a story about our troubled planet through animation and illustration. I intend to bring awareness about single-use plastic pollution by disseminating my work on social media. My concerns for the environment started when I lived in Iran. I visited Caspian Sea and saw the beach uh, covered with plastic. Most countries struggle with their waste and uh, we live in the age of plastic. Everything we use is somehow made of this material and it has made our life a lot more convenient. However, this convenience in using single-use plastic materials uh, is destroying the ecosystem. Our, as our reliance on it increases, it is filling up the oceans and the landfills. 
we are now at the point where the planet is suffocating from our for our human needs. And as I mentioned, my focus is mostly on single use uh, materials. Uh, we use these items for such a short period of time and uh, they get abandoned somewhere on the planet. Uh, one of my concerns is that how can a material that lasts so long be considered single use? Uh, I believe that art is a powerful tool to address our problems, just as the book Art in the Anthropocene states, in the face of uh, exploitation, brutality, empowerment, shouldn't art address human suffering and struggles? Um, I see drawing as my primarily creative tool. Uh, my way of expressing my thoughts has always been through drawing. Uh, my interest in animation goes back to my childhood, but somehow I never explored it. And um, sorry about that. Uh, when I started the MFA program, uh, I tried to think of a way that's versatile, and uh, that allows me to draw and tell stories and creating animation was what came to my mind. At first I started animating by creating a stop motions and with using a plastic bag and 2D drawings. However, after just a little bit after I started my master's degree, the pandemic happened and uh, shifted my focus. Uh, I was experiencing lots of lockdowns and uh, various precautionary health measures. Uh, therefore, it greatly impacted the way I was understanding different concepts and ways of us seeing the world while working on this research. After all, just as uh, Donna Harvey says, it matters what matters we use. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, it matters what matters we use to think other matters with. It matters what the stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what nots, not nots. What thoughts think thoughts. What descriptions describe descriptions. What ties tie ties. It matters what the stories we make, what the stories make wars, what wars make a stories. And so I created a, uh, I decided to um, create works of art that are not limited to physical space and, and that can be distributed on social media. This helped me to come closer to my goal of bringing awareness about plastic pollution to a broader audience. And uh, rather than being limited to the boundaries of the space, uh, I, the primarily platform that I use uh, for my works is, uh, Instagram and my account is called a yellow lamp. Uh, to me, yellow stands out for freshness, positive energy, and more importantly, hope. Uh, it is also a color that is being used to grab people's attention uh, for danger or to be more cautious. Uh, to me, a yellow land is where we attempt to create a better world. And uh, it is a land that we are more conscious of our uh, decisions and um, live a more sustainable life, lifestyle. Um, Instagram is a visual-based platform and values both visual and text-based content. Uh, so many people around the world can have access to it and it enables them to keep up with my projects and uh, my content no matter where they are. Uh, and to me, uh, nowness is an important factor. And uh, recently, when uh, and just as we were trying to reduce our use of single-use plastics by like banning plastic bags and things like that, uh, the pandemic hit, and uh, now new forms of plastic are added to the previous ones. Personal protective equipments are necessary, and uh, I found, but I find it. Uh, ironic that we avoid one problem by creating another problem, which is using excessive amount of plastics and abandoning them in nature. Uh, so I, I was while I was uh, working for my MFA, and I created two films, and uh, one of them is Dareness, one of them is called Living in the Ruins. Each of them tackles one aspect of pandemic and the pollution, and you can see them on my Instagram and my website and uh, read about them. Uh, however, today I want to share my last 
project, my last MFA project, uh, which exhibits three loop uh, that I worked on during spring, summer 2021. Uh, they are part of a bigger body of work and uh, I'm still working on them. This project is called uh, Living with the Trouble. Uh, it focuses on our troubled age. The title is influenced by Donna Harvey's book, Staying with the Trouble. Uh, according to Harvey, in order to stay with the trouble, we need to be present. Uh, it is not about being between our past and future, uh, but about being entwined in place, times, and matters, and, uh, and meanings. Living with the trouble uh, is about the time uh, we face our troubles and spend time to change them. Um, so the first loop uh, is called Troubled, and it is a frame-by-frame -frame animation. Uh, it's made out of 240 hand-drawn digital drawings using rotoscopy animation. Uh, it represents an infinite loop reflecting on our troubled age, the age we live in. This self-portrait represents me as an individual who experienced these unprecedented times just as many other people who lived through this time uh, did. And uh, in the beginning, the masks uh, bring a safe, uh, sense of safety and comfort. However, as it goes on, the masks pile on each other and uh, on my face. And um, just like they pile up uh, in the oceans, in the landfills and suffocate the planet. Um, the second loop is a metaphorsis loop. Uh, and it is titled uh, Something's Out There. Metaphorsis is a suitable technique to demonstrate contrast. Uh, therefore, I took advantage of this technique to show the life and all of the paradoxes within it. Uh, I feel that storytelling has always been a strong aspect of my work. And in this project, I try to visualize a new form of a story inspired by my childhood, like a once upon a time, once upon a time, a style of a story. And, um, the third one is um, called Where Do They Go? Uh, I have always wondered if we are truly facing the problems we have caused with single-use plastics or uh, we are just running away from them. This last animation attempts to visualize my thoughts surrounding this topic and uh, it is called as I mentioned, where do they go? Uh, it is a transition loop uh, and it just starts uh, slowly with my barefoot walking on the grass. And um, as I move forward, I still I slowly see pieces of gloves, masks scattered on the ground. Uh, I try to walk faster. The more I see these objects, uh, I, the faster I walk. And uh, it reaches to the point where I'm running among all of these abandoned uh, objects uh, in the um, grass covered uh, with them. Uh, these two loops are distributed through my Instagram page. Uh, the audience can join and watch them as they are scrolling. And uh, it does not matter where they arrive, uh, when they arrive. Uh, there is no specific beginning and end to them. Uh, and that I, I feel like that uh, helps the audience to engage with them easier. And, uh, and at the end, I'm gonna show these two loops to you. Um, my, I, I think that plastic pollution has different causes. There are various people and organizations that I think we can point our finger on and blame it for them. Um, however, I believe that we need to take responsibility and start to start with ourselves, no matter how small this change can be. Um, this is why I started this project uh, to play my own role and the way I can and put my creativity and artistic practice into discussing this issue and with the people around me. Um, thank you for listening. I will now uh, play these three animations that I talked about. Hope you enjoyed.
Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Maide, for sharing your incredible work. It is hard to believe that that beautiful swift motion comes from hundreds of drafted pages. That was really great. Thank you for that. And last but not least, introducing our final speaker for the night, Warren Brown. Uh, recently recognized as a recipient of Water Canada's 2021 Water Wastewater Operator, as well as 2021 Water Steward of the Year, Warren has been a longtime advocate and leader for water safety and security within his community as the operations manager with Lytton First Nation. And even more so, he collaborates with Indigenous communities all across Canada through the water industry, as well as through his work with nonprofit water movement, um, aiming to address Canada's ongoing Indigenous water crisis, where Warren takes on a key role of connecting water operators across the nation through training and knowledge sharing. That's a little bit about Warren. You're welcome to elaborate more on your background and your experiences. I now offer the stage up to you, Warren. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Eden, for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm Warren Brown, the present manager for the Lytton First Nation uh, O&M department. I've been here now for going on 20 years. I uh, started back in July 2002. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, I'm also from Lytton, which is roughly to give some people an idea where we are. It's about four hours north of Vancouver, uh, driving by car. So yeah, back to the other stuff. Uh, yeah, I started in July 2002. I became a certified water operator that following October of the same year. Uh, actually became the manager for the O&M department in 2015. The previous manager, he retired, so uh, they figured I was a good fit and I stepped in. So with our O&M department, I, I look after six people. Three of them are water operators, water operators, including myself. We look after seven different water systems, five POEs, or uh, they're called point of entry, which is a, a single home filtration units for some of our smaller homes that don't qualify for a water system. So we try to give them the some safe drinking water as best we can. Uh, we also manage 30 kilometers of roads, and we also look after banned buildings, which uh, <laughs> within the last, that last year, I guess we lost a few buildings. So yeah, I'm a certified water operator, small water systems, water treatment and water, distribu water distribution level two. I've also got a diploma in water treatment from Thompson's River University. Sorry, my granddaughter's in here too, so. <laughs> uh, my work history, I was a youth leader when I was a kid, uh, trying to find things to do for within our community for our youth to do. So whether it be going for walks or 
cleaning uh, people's yards and whatnot, just trying to give the uh, kids something to look forward to as to what to do in our small community. Uh, I was also a gas attendant, laborer, first aid on drilling rigs, a paramedic, a high school volleyball coach, a BMX racing coach, a DJ, and now I'm here. <laughs> so through my life, I've actually, before I got this job, I considered being a, a social worker just because I like talking to people and uh, trying to help as best I can. Uh, I did apply to TRU way back when as a, as a student, I was accepted. But at the same time, I applied for this job and I was accepted for the job as well. So I chose a job just because my girlfriend, who is now my wife, she was pregnant at the time. So we had to make some choices. <laughs> so school was out and work started. So getting around to meeting a whole bunch of very interesting people, such as yourselves, uh, meeting you on here online, it's, it's awesome to hear these stories and uh, the other things that people are doing out there. It's, it's great. It's great to see. Uh, uh, Bita and Addy from University of Calgary with the water movement, they actually reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested in uh, joining in on some of their videos that they're planning to make. And some of these videos are for like training, uh, trying to help water operators understand some of the some of the things that they have to do out in the field. So they gave me the idea and where they want to uh, record me doing certain things in a water plant that they can put onto their YouTube and took off from there, I guess. Uh, I, I hear it's been viewed quite a few times and whatnot. So with the water movement, that's one of the groups that we worked with, with Lytton First Nation. We also worked with uh, Rizzo out of UBC. They helped us uh, install a new water treatment facility for one of our small reserves. And we work with a lot of students from the UBC as well, uh, university uh, engineering students and whatnot. They came up and did their tests and it was very interesting to watch them do their do their tests. But I believe some of those tests were also included with the, their homework or part of their studies, I believe. Uh, so yeah, they helped us with the water system. Uh, I work, I'm presently working with another group called Aqua Intelligent. They are working on uh, an app program for monitoring water systems that are way out there. Like for us, for our seven different water systems, just to give an idea how long it takes for us to check our water systems in one day, my operator takes off at nine o'clock in the morning. He's usually back around three o'clock in the afternoon we travel roughly 140 kilometers to do a round trip of checking all seven water systems. And that, that time scope is based on if there's no problems out there. If there's problems, then he'll be, he'll be working a little later. <laughs> uh, with the COVID, when COVID first came in, uh, we didn't really know what COVID was or like what kind of illness it was, how did you catch it and whatnot? So the health authorities around here were very supportive in giving us everything they figured we needed, such as plastic suits, a whole bunch of uh, wipes, uh, disinfection, fluids, everything. Uh, we were all sort of taken back to that in our, in our department and our band as a whole, we because nobody really knew what COVID was or how it was uh, transmitted at the time. Uh, everybody just went home. Everybody started working from home and uh, trying, to con trying to keep the band moving from home. But the O&M department was a different, different, uh, uh, different area of work entirely where we can't necessarily uh, fix a road from home, we have to actually be out there in the field working. So we have to make a few changes in regards to uh, making sure we're, we're not sick. We had to do extra cleaning, the, the disinfection at the door, the signing of the book and everything else. Uh, had to make sure all our vehicles were cleaned out and everybody was uh, 
assigned a certain vehicle that they had to stick with. Uh, we couldn't pick up any more, any more of our members that who, who may be hitchhiking on the road. We couldn't pick them up any at all. And then we went around and we started cleaning and wiping down all of our water systems because again, we didn't know what, what this was or how it came about in the beginning. And uh, yeah, so we just kept the water moving. We kept the roads passable. We made sure the buildings were all safe and we went around and had to install all the disinfection stations and whatnot for, for some of the returning staff after things had settled down. And I guess the precautions are, they're not as serious anymore, but everybody does take the hand washing and staying home if you're not feeling well, very serious. Uh, ongoing challenges, trying to keep up with the mandates, I guess, the, the ever-changing mandates, it's, it's always changing for us. And, and being in a small rural community, we, I usually get all my stuff off the news. Uh, some people may see that differently, but that's where I get some of my information, not all. Uh, and then, yeah, with the man changing mandates, we are starting to fatigue. Uh, the majority of us are vaccinated here and just other general concerns, I suppose, as, as to who can enter offices and whatnot. Uh, we're still working through some of that stuff, the, the, the rules and, and everything else within our nation. Uh, mainly because lately we have, we are currently working on the recovery of our community. So we're, we have a whole bunch of contractors here. Uh, we've got truck drivers, laborers and whatnot coming from all over to work in our area to try and recover our community. So we're trying to come up with a, a special plan for that to monitor the COVID in this area, hoping that we won't get an outbreak that'll slow down the, the rebuild of our community. Uh, there was a question about how do, how can you get involved with uh, First Nation communities with some of your ideas? Uh, the only thing I, I, I was asked, sorry, I was asked a similar question at another conference and I just said, just reach out to a nearby First Nation that's nearby, nearby to your community and just say hello, uh, meet with the administrator or the chief. Uh, if you if you want to work on something school related or something of your own of your own uh, studies or whatever, just explain your plans from the start to the end with the administrator or chief and see if they'd give you permission to to ask questions or to talk to whoever you want to talk to in regards to whatever your topic is. Uh, our doors are usually, well, because of COVID, where our doors are no longer open, but if you knock on the door, we'll answer and have a look and say, hey, what's up? <laughs> but my door is always open, and I've had people come, come in and just chit-chat and talk and tell me what, what their hopes are and what, what they want to learn, and I always give an open offer of, hey, do you want to take a full tour of our water systems? That's one of my selling points for coming to visit me. My door is open. If you guys ever want a tour of our water facilities, we'll give it to you. It's a long drive and it's a very beautiful drive. Uh, so again, I sort of touched on it a little bit, but yeah, Lytton was involved in a big uh, devastating fire last year in the end of June. So we're in, in the recovery stages and watching having to see the the rebuilding of the community from from the ground up again it's it is amazing to watch the the engineers and the contractors and everything else go over all the plans and and decisions and uh on where to start how it's going to start and what's going to follow after that in a in a in a series of construction construction plans and having to be part of all that stuff it's great oh sorry i guess yeah that's it so with the the fire uh i, I do have a fire fire story out there uh beta i gave a copy to beta and addy with uh, water movement 
and it's also been published in the EOCP magazine article as, a, as an article. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Warren. Sorry to cut you off short there. Um, I'm sure there will be still be plenty of time for you to elaborate more on the topics that you touched on, especially within your community and water movement and um, all your other endeavors in this Q&A period. Um, and with that, I am opening the floor to more questions to the participants if you'd like to submit a question to our Q&A function for Chris, Maya, and Warren. Um, and again, thank you, Chris, Maida, and Warren for even speaking, for taking the time to speak. And it looks like we already have questions here for, for some of you. And appreciation in the chat as well. Thank you to all the participants. All right. Okay. Well, okay, the very first question is addressed to directly to Chris here. And I believe, honestly, we could also open the floor up to, to Maida and Warren about this as well. Um, I guess in response to your presentation earlier and your story, in the age of digital evolutions and technological evolutions, um, I suppose, where do you see that in the context of the pandemic, especially with everyone having to have to stay home and be a little bit more disconnected as well, more physically. Um, in what ways can oneself and communities develop and grow together? And also just as um, I mentioned, that question was asked by Shmuel. Thank you, Shmuel, for your question. Yeah, so I guess it's kind of like a two-part answer. I guess a three-part answer. The first thing is like, Assuming that you're not talking about like community and like bonding, right? The way I would frame my question is what are you trained to see? So what you're looking for is what you'll find. Um, in an own personal, very vulnerable story, uh, I was very scared of women uh, growing up. So imagine going on Instagram and seeing all these confident, like suave guys. Well, I can either see that as um inadequacies in me so there's such a huge gap between that person and I guess who I am now <laughs> uh and or I could see that as hey these are some tips and tricks that they're using to um, instill confidence in themselves like how do I grow and how do I put in um how do I implement that into my own life right so I can see this exact same situation as like a bad thing and it's probably going to fuel my depression and fuel my insecurities or I can see it as a a fuel or an avenue for growth. So I think that's very important to first kind of look inwards of how you're looking at the digital media that you're getting exposed to. With regards to actually connecting, it's not the same. Honestly, for me, I'm a social guy. I love being around my friends. I'm a hugger, right? Not being able to like hug my friends and see them in person, it's, it's nowhere near the same as seeing somebody online. With that being said, you're kind of stuck. Right. So the reason why I kind of gave strategies for your own personal well-being is you're stuck. Right. Sometimes you can't rely on other people either through technology and you can't see or the COVID and you can't see them or you just don't feel like you have anybody to talk to or you don't trust anybody to help you. Right. So the strategies that I provided um, are just ways for you to kind of take it on on your own as a supplement to being able to, like, have a good support system whether it's through just texting your friend, giving him a call at three in the morning, whether it's therapy, whatever you like. The, like I said in the presentation, the way you heal is the way you heal, right? Whichever way you feel like you want to heal, the whole point is to get yourself out, right? Go into survival mode, do whatever you can, whether it's a Zoom call, whether it's phone call, like anything to connect with your friends, if that's how you heal. Um, I didn't need that because I'm a very like personal growth oriented person. So it's more sustainable that way. If I know that I'm good and then I use it, uh, externally as a supplement to it. Thank you, Chris. And I guess elaborating on that, you do speak a lot about um, how that connection has really affected your personal um, life and your personal relationships. And I guess Warren or Maida, you're also welcome to chime in on this end. Mm -hmm. um, 
I guess within the context of your community and the way you work for your business and within your water systems, your operators, um, as well as Maida with how you interact with um, creating your visuals and who you bring your art to, um, as far as like advocating for, uh, for what plastic pollution is doing to our world right now. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess how has that really impacted and what challenges um, have you had to overcome with that? Like, how do you stay kind of building that and going together? Um, honestly, I'm not good with this question because give me some suggestions too. I don't know how to <laughs> avoid being uh, isolated in this uh, age of technology. But at the same time, as an immigrant, it has really helped me to come closer to people that are really, really far from me. And uh, it has really helped me through the pandemic, through the lockdowns to stay connected with other people and um, not feel isolated as much. Uh, so it's, it, it has two blades. So uh, you need to sometimes uh, try to navigate around it and find your balance. Uh, it's hard, but uh, I feel like it is a part of our life that we can't really change. And it, the more we go, forward is going to be more uh it, it's going to have more impact in our life and it's it's it should be a thing that we have to learn to adapt ourselves to it and find the balance awesome thank you Margaret um and I did also want to redirect the question directly to Warren um I suppose with your work with water movement and creating new uh, training videos for other water operators across Canada. Have you found that, um, I guess, in this age of technology and especially within the pandemic, um, not being able to see one another, has this kind of mm -hmm. seen a greater effect of this and greater impact in the community of making it efficient um, and yeah, just meaningful within other Indigenous communities? Uh in regards to the the videos or just keeping in contact with the outside world in general either or you can address oh. either. yeah also um you sorry you when at the end of your story you were also talking about the recovery of lipid uh in the case that also affects your work with the recovery process you can also elaborate on that as well uh ooh, that's a long question <laughs> No, sorry, you can take a moment to like absorb yeah. it and reflect. Uh, yeah, technology has helped a lot with the with uh, the water industry in regards to like keeping up on current events and uh, new technologies out there via uh, platforms like this, the Zoom, and uh, uh, there's another video thing out there I, I don't know what it is I just click on these things and say hey how's it going <laughs> but anyway uh yes it does help us keep in contact with some of the engineers and whatnot that I work with and also with other water operators from other communities uh every now and then you get a a, a call or a text or whatnot or whatnot and because we can't meet face to face yeah we'll, we'll do a zoom and just discuss what what is happening out there at their water plant or if they just have a simple question or just want to say hi uh, it keeps us in contact and the first nation water operators we also use use uh, the facebook so we have a facebook page for first nations water operators where we can put questions down and whatnot and help each other as best we can through that uh, technology i'm not very good with technology honestly like putting split screens on and doing some other stories or whatever else on these things that uh, I haven't figured that stuff out yet, but uh, it, it's been great. It, it's good if you get the right young person to do the work for me to get me on online and get the, the video going. It's, it works great. Yeah. Thank you, Warren. <laughs> uh, on that note, we actually have a question in the queue here as well that is relevant to what you just touched on um, and it's directed to you. 
what is your biggest challenge in your field? Um, you touched on technology, but if you have any other challenges, you can feel, feel free to elaborate as well. Um, and then a follow-up question to that is, do you still think about becoming a social worker? And I know that you're a very busy man and you do a lot for your community across, and as well as for other communities across Canada. So is there, yeah, do you think about becoming a social worker? I almost feel like I, I am still touching a little bit on the, the social work stuff. Like when you talk to other water operators and you listen to their challenges from their communities and then you start asking questions as to, okay, what else is in your area? What, what else can be done? You, I listen to the stories and I try to help them as best I can and give them some encouragement on how they can try and do it themselves by maybe utilizing something that they told me that, within their community and just, uh, yeah, just keep in touch and see how things go. So I'm still talking with people out there, like as a good friend and listening to their, their problems and issues and everything else. Uh, with the First Nation water operators, there's, there's a few issues and a few uh, uh, challenges for us out there. So the first question regards to what's the hardest challenge, it's trying to keep a water operator working for the First Nations community. Uh, I say that because First Nation community water operators were paid probably half or less, less than half of what we would be earning out in the uh, municipalities. So if I was working for the village of Lytton or for Vernon or something, I'd be earning probably twice what I'm earning here in my community. But I stay within my, commu my community because my family and my friends are all here. So I'm just trying to make, ensure that the the water we're producing is safe for everybody and keeping them all healthy and hopefully keeping our community strong with that. So yeah, that's that's the biggest challenge for water operators in First Nation communities. And that's something I've been, uh, with the help of the water movement, on um, trying to change, trying to get us a fair fair wage, a, a living wage. Like our, our my wage itself, I'm pretty well at the poverty level. And it's, uh, I just had to look it up like, wow, I'm totally shocked. But, you know, it is what it is. But I am happy doing what I'm doing. And the best thing I, I enjoy is just hearing the, the community members say thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for all the things that you do for our community and keep us safe and keep us informed. Thank you so much, Warren. Um, unfortunately, uh, with again the time constraints, uh, we are kind of we do have to wrap up our Q and A session. I'm sure that there are lots of questions that could have been distributed to all the other speakers as well during this event that lots of people would want to know about. In the case that um, you have other questions that you want to ask for our speakers, you can certainly send an email directly to us, where we distribute them to our speakers. Um, and thank you, Chris, Maida, and Warren for all your insights and all your stories. It's been amazing and incredible. And with that, we thank you all for joining us and participating today for all your questions and just being here. And again, especially to all our speakers for your stories, work, and experiences. I'll now be passing it on to Sunny um, to update us on any upcoming opportunities for us. Thank you, Madden. So just before we wrap up today's event, here are some upcoming opportunities to get involved with the SDTAs in the upcoming months. Um, so first, in the winter, we have the SDTA Executive Committee recruitment, um, who would be in charge of organizing events like this, managing our social media, and doing all of the back-end reparations for creating a community at UCalgary that fostered to um, like develop SDGs um, at the University of Calgary. Um, and in the spring, we would have a recruitment of the SDG Summit Committee, um, where we'll dedicate the whole team to create a SDG Summit. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm going to pass off to Eden. Um, we, would, we would include more contact information and in our social media so you could follow us and get updated on the news as well as like get access to the forum when they're out. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Eden. All right, yeah, we'd like to further extend our thanks to organization representatives who attended today, 
to Calgary International, as well as the Office of Sustainability for the logistical support for this event. And finally, thank you to the SCGA team for your ongoing commitment to having these discussions. Um, we hope that you all enjoyed the event and learned a little bit more about how people, how local Canadians um, all across Canada are doing work internationally or locally in their own communities pay for international development. Um, we implore you to continue reflecting and having these important conversations um, and remain resilient during these unprecedented times. We will also be sending out a follow-up survey to this event so keep a lookout for that as we greatly appreciate your feedback. And again, if you have any follow-up questions for our speakers or for the organization itself, feel free to email it to us at scgalliance at ecalgary.ca or DM us on Instagram. Um, yeah, feel free to follow along on our social media platforms to get in touch with us. Right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>